It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, December 22nd, 2011. I am James Burns. We now go to Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how's it going? Well, pretty good. Pretty good uh, as we approach the beginnings of Christmas. Christmas and, of course, uh, the new year upon us, uh, 2012. Some fearing that it might be the last year, but (laughs) you always have a group like that out there, you know, worried about the end instead of, you know, the present. And, you know, there's a lot of concern going on around the world, of course, economically. And something we've been talking in great detail about on the show is, you know, with what's been uh, transpiring in the Eurozone. Bob, what is the latest there? Well, there are some people who think that um, the uh, European Union will stay together. And uh, that very, very well might be so. But I think um, the Eurozone is going to have several failures, Um, six maybe as many as eight dropouts. And I think eventually they could break away with just the uh, nine or eight or ten members and say, well, we're going to do it this way. the uh, information that came out yesterday, and I, I can't quote the numbers because I can't remember them all. And the bottom line is uh, we're talking about uh, between what well, Germany has secretly given, lent to uh, the European Central Bank, and uh, what the Central Bank is going to monetize is going to be over a trillion dollars. And uh, these are three-year loans, which is absurd, at 1%. So, you know, they get the the money at 1%, and the next step is uh, is they'll lend it out, uh, and that's what they're hoping they'll do, at, uh, say, 7 or 8%. So it uh, it's nice work if you can get it. I mean... We don't get deals uh, thrown in our lap like that as citizens of any country. But be as it may, um, how long is that going to carry them? Well, it all depends on how much money uh, Spain and and Italy need. And I think one of the things I picked up today, um, Spain is already digging into them for money, and I'm sure Italy will quickly. And then you've got the other four that are in real trouble. And um, how long will a, a million last? Uh, there's 523 banks involved, if you could believe that. Uh, plus the countries that lend money and then lend it back to themselves again. Rather absurd, but uh, uh, that's the way it is. And uh, so we're probably talking six months. I don't see how they can go any further than that. And then they're going to come back again. They're going to say, oh, we're going to need uh, another one of those million things, trillion things, excuse me. And uh, and so they'll go do that. And all they're doing is doing what the U.S. did for a couple of years with TARP, TARP, GARP, MARP, and all of these stupid things that they uh, lent everybody and his brother. It, the figure was $29 trillion dollars. A good part of it was paid back, but we still don't know how much. But it's the infusion itself that disrupts the markets. And uh, when companies should be going under, they're not. They get a second lease on life, supplied by the local fascist government. And so uh, I think it'll be ongoing. How long will it last? Maybe two years. Um, Will some of them go under? Yes, they will. Uh, Greece and probably uh, Portugal, Ireland, and Belgium. And uh, so what's the bad side to all this? Happens to be um, a thing called inflation. 
And, of course, they're saying, oh, gee, uh, we're not going to have any of that. We're going to under control. And I can't remember where I've heard that before because so many people said the same thing in history. So uh, that's the time frame. Uh, they they knuckled down to just creating money. That's what the trillion dollar swap was all about between uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the European Central Bank to make sure that uh, these banks in Europe could stay in business. Another thing coming up, overall refinancing in the first quarter is a third for the year. And then during the remainder of the year, they have to raise two-thirds of the total. I don't know where the money is going to come from. And so uh, that's still a problem. I mean, you get French banks, uh, the three or four largest banks, uh, uh, they're on the hook for some serious numbers here. Let me see if I can pick them up here, because this is what I've been writing about. And... Um, Let's see what we got here. I think it's about thirty billion in the first quarter. I mean that's a lot of money. And uh and then they get the loans from the E C B they gotta deal with. They'll probably give them a pass for the time being. And uh the total debt is eight hundred billion for the year. That's gotta be rolled, never mind the new money. And you get get this. Seventy five percent is unsecured. I mean, that means like uh, uh, Burns and Chapman Incorporated get out of the bank and say, we want $10 million. And they say, um, well, what do you guys do? And we tell them. They say, okay, well, do you have any collateral? No, we don't have any. And they say, well, okay, we'll give you the, we'll, we'll give you the, the loan anyway because we want to make loans, so it's your lucky day. And so 75% of them have no collateralization. Unbelievable. Yeah. But, Bob, uh, instead of using our real names, I suggest we go with the Three Stooges approach. Dewey, Cheatham, and Hal. <laughs> yeah, Dewey, Cheatham, and Hal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, seriously, I mean, if, if a whole bunch of countries leave the European Union, they say, we're done with this, we're tired of it, we want out. I mean, how many have to leave before it's no longer technically the European Union anymore? I mean, it can't be if, say, at least 50-plus percent of the countries are no longer part of it. Well, all they really need is 8 or 10 out of 17. And it'll stay together. But the German people don't want it. And, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways of looking at this thing. I mean, people look at biblical prophecy and say it's eight. And, uh, but, you know, the interpretation, is the interpretation correct? I mean, do we really know? Um, we have so many people saying so many interpretations of the Bible. Um, who's right? I mean, on one subject, you can have a hundred or a thousand different opinions. So uh, you you have to put that into the background, I think, and deal with uh, present day and what we see and where it could go uh, based upon what happened in the past. And uh, that's the way we got to work at it. And th that's a cold, hard truth. But I'm still, uh, you know, I am still, uh, I still don't know what they're up to. Uh, we know what they could do. We know what they might like to do. But we're not behind the scenes. I mean, look at the amount of money they just came up with for this new program, uh, LOTF or whatever it's called. Oh, it's 600 and something billion plus what the Germans lent them. So it's a trillion dollars in round figures. And um, that was very surprising. Uh, I didn't think, I, I think it was just like a fight. Uh, somebody just threw the towel and said, hey, if we don't do what the Americans did, the Fed Reserve, 
uh, we're out of business. And they just threw it together and went for monetization. And that's inflation, if not hyperinflation. Because they're going to have to do it four or five times just to keep the whole thing going. And then you've got France might get a single or a double uh, <clears throat> rate decrease. And that's going to mess everything up because it's going to supposedly force the rates higher uh, for, the, um, for the people who are borrowing money through the European Central Bank. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions, but when all is said and done, it's very inflationary. And second of all, they haven't, they haven't solved the problem. They have not solved the problem. They just threw some money at it. They did nothing to create jobs. Oh, they're telling the banks, banks, uh, you've got to lend money to these companies. Well, let's assume they do it. Will it really create jobs? Is the demand there? Well, are they too late? You know, they've been messing around with that, this thing for two years. They didn't get serious until a week ago. I mean, during the summer, they had six weeks. They did nothing. It was vacation time. Now, I'm surprised they didn't anything at all during Christmas. Highly unusual. But I think they had the plan mapped out, and they had to make a decision, do we go that way or don't we? And I think the decision was made, we're going to go that way. And that was the result. So I think that's where it's headed. Headed. How long will it take uh, the Fed to get their trillion dollars back? Don't know. Um, will they lose money if Greece goes under? Well, the American banks will. Yeah. It's going to be an ongoing problem. It's not going to go away. No, because they keep kicking the can down the road, and they have no real solutions to how to solve any of this, as you've you know, stated time and time again, Bob. And I, I honestly believe that they intentionally loaned them the money just to put us further in the hole. Well, we're in, in a peripheral way. I rather think that the uh, swap agreements probably will – be closed out once they th see things are working uh, with the plan that they just put in place. And if they are, well, the Fed will get their money back, and uh, I guess they redeposit it into their accounts and cancel out the money and credit that they created. But maybe they won't. Maybe it'll be used on another project. Yeah, they always come up with something new and fun to do to at the uh, people's expense. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website the international forecaster.com and a couple of days ago uh, they reported that Kim Jong-il passed away some people believe that he's been dead and it's been nothing more than a body double and now you have his son uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, his uh, uncle and the military it looks like they're going to be uh, sharing power Bob do you think that uh, things are just going to continue the way they are in uh, North Korea and that entire region of the of the planet or do you think things could potentially um, spin out of control, possibly a, a coup attempt or, a, dare I say, uh, you know, one of those uh, you know, Chinese-style uh, liberations of North Korea, even though they're technically the puppet masters of North Korea. What, what do you see happening there in the new situation that's brewing? Well, I think it's going to continue the way it is uh, because the military has their hand in running the show. Um, but I've always uh, been skeptical uh, about the relationship between North Korea and the United States. Uh, I, I think that North Korea co cooperated with the U.S. And I have nothing to base that on, except you know, my history and, and counterintelligence. And it just uh, seems a made-to-order deal, so to speak. And um, I, I, I think that's what's been going on there for a long time. And, you know, uh, we were the guys who financed Mayo Say Tung and, and his uh, brother-in-law, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, keep on thinking, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah. And uh, we, we were financing both sides of that thing. And, of course, in those days, uh, people like myself didn't know that until I got involved with the government and I saw what they were doing. 
Yeah, I mean, I, it doesn't – that wouldn't really surprise me if that was the case, unfortunately. I mean, with the how brutal things are in North Korea, you know, at a level of tyranny beyond most of the other countries in the world. Meanwhile, we're, we're so focused on the plight of Libya and Iraq. I mean, yeah, they, they have it bad there, but compared to what – the people of North Korea have to endure. I mean, it's a walk in the park, and yet we just look the other way for the most part. Well, you're right about that. But human life is not a consideration. Power is a consideration, and the accumulation of wealth. And so if they, the people behind the scenes, that's their criteria. It has nothing to do with uh, morality and the way things should be done. Now, that's the sad reality in any form of government throughout the entire planet is that most of the people that end up rising up in the ranks are the slime balls, are the ones that are corrupt, that are, you know, (laughs) compromised, bought and paid for. And most of these people are sociopaths and psychopaths, and they could care less about the people. Well, that's shown to be true right here in America. Absolutely, and... I mean that, that that I mean that's a good point we can we can go into now is some that you know it, it we knew this was coming the attacks on Ron Paul by the mainstream media even though they they knew about these supposed newsletters that he didn't write he said he didn't write them and I I you know Ron Paul strikes me as an honest guy it tells it like it is I think if he would have wrote them years ago he would admit to it and I don't think he did but you know the mainstream media they're not going to let it go cuz it's one of the few things they have on him meanwhile they're falsely accusing him of being racist but he talks about things that are very anti-racist, ending the war on terror, ending the war on drugs. You know, both issues affect a lot of non-white peoples throughout the planet. And meanwhile, you have Obama. You know, he's carried on the war on drugs. He's carried on the war on terror. And if you get Romney, New Gingrich, Bachman, you know, who accused Ron Paul of if he's president, she said that, you know, nukes going to go off in the country. That's, you know, fear-mongering there. And all the other neocons. So, I mean, honestly, I mean, which group's more racist, Team Tyranny, i.e. Obama and the neocons, or Ron Paul? Well, obviously I'm not a racist because uh, they have me in an all-black station uh, five or six times a year, so they wouldn't call me back if they thought I was a racist. <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what so-called publication was this that he had written these blasphemies? Well, uh, during the... Uh, see, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. He had several uh, publications with his name attached to him. And he said several times, you know, I had my names attached to him, but, you know, I wasn't a writer. You know, I was busy doing my medical thing. I was busy giving out speeches. And I didn't have a chance or opportunity to, you know, read over every single publication that went out because they were going on, they were going out all the time. And it was the equivalent of the modern day blogging, you know, modern day internet with, you know, snail mail. So, Obviously, he didn't have the opportunity to read every single letter that came out by all these ghostwriters. And it is sad that, you know, somebody, whoever was responsible for this, hasn't come forward and admitted that they did it. And it, it's just definitely something that the mainstream media will not let go of. And I just believe that they need to. <laughs> I mean, here's a guy that's been completely honest about everything. I mean. He answered your questions. I mean, he, when, whenever he was running for president in 2007, 2008, they brought this up to him. He answered the question then. They asked it to him several times this week alone, like every single five seconds they're always asking him. I mean, how many times does he have to tell you what he knows and doesn't know? I mean, I mean, I know it's their job. You well, know, I saw him like, today walk away from CNN. Yeah, uh, let's see, what's her name? Um, yeah, that happened yesterday. Gloria Borger. Uh, it turns out, uh, dig a little dirt on her, uh, this reporter from CNN, she's married to a guy named Lance Morgan, and he is the chief communications and crisis strategist for Pal Tate, which is a D.C. firm that represents lobbies for the military-industrial complex. Surprise! So it doesn't surprise me that the wife of a guy working for the uh, you know, military-industrial complex, who's pro-war, that's how they make their money, would want to get out the most anti-war candidate running for the White House. I mean, it seems a little um, suspicious, in my opinion. I think so. But here, here's well, a Well, you question. probably see more of that. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I think the, the thing that shocks me is that there are some Christians who think that Ron Paul's not a Christian and that um, there are some things that 
uh, he's soft on socially. And, you know, I, I, it was on a program last night, and I said, well, who are you going to vote for? And they said, nobody. I said, well, that's not very intelligent. And uh, I, I said, you know, we've got to get somebody in the White House who is going to have to help us as American citizens because we're not getting any help from anybody anywhere. And the retort was, <clears throat> uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I think uh, being right about the Bible, uh, this person's interpretation thereof, is more important. I mean, it's just like suicidal. And I don't, I don't know how people think that way. We have to deal with the, the situation that we have and do the best we have or can do. And maybe for some people it's a, a giant choice. <clears throat> for me it isn't. I mean, I'm going to vote for Ron Paul. Uh, you know, when people say, well, that's the best of the worst, I said, well, you got to vote for somebody or the bad guys continue to run the show. And we don't want that. I mean, look, I mean, the president can have anybody he wants exterminated anytime he wants. I mean, he might play in a basketball game with somebody and they might beat him and the guy might bang him around because he does play basketball. And he might go over the Secret Service agent and say, have that goofball picked up and send him to Guantanamo. <laughs> we don't know whether we have another Nero or a Caligula. We're going to find out. Oh, boy, it's a tough way to find out, let me tell you. Well, I agree entirely. I mean, Ron Paul is a million times better choice than all the other options we have. And it just it just shows how far down uh, this supposed uh, – journalism media known as the mainstream media has gone and they 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 won't attack anyone else though they won't attack michelle bachman because of her years as an irs tax attorney how many lives did she ruin what about all the crap that perry did in texas what about all the uh, business scandals that romney's involved with and all the different companies he owns from behind the scenes no they won't talk about that but they'll attack ron paul over something that you know has been proven to be a bunch of bs it's just I don't know, it gets me kind of ticked off. But, I mean, it just comes with the territory, I know. <clears throat> well, it's not a nice game. But usually the people who make these kind of negative decisions uh, in, in, in congruity with the public, they usually end up paying. It's just like somebody goes through life um, – being unfair to people, we'll put it that way. And, uh, you know, there's a saying, what goes around comes around. And uh, I think that uh, it's going to happen many of these cases. And uh, I'm sure they'll all blame it all on Ron Paul and maybe even me for that matter. But it's going to come. You know, you get what you deserve out of life. And there's, sort of, there's some sort of a balance uh, within humanity, and you do the right things, things are going to work out for you. And uh, you do things to hurt other people, uh, sooner or later you're going to pay. I, I heard of someone today who was in the financial industry who thought that they were better than everybody else. It was very nasty to everybody else, and the party just got fired for stealing $140,000 from the company that they work for. And, you know, sooner or later, the hammer falls. And I think that's what's going to happen to the Illuminus in the next election. <clears throat> I think the truth is going to come out in many different ways, and I think Ron Paul is going to win. And, um, and I hope I'm right. Not for my sake, you know, I'm coming toward the end of the trail. But there's lots and lots and lots and of young people who have to live through the next centuries. 
And uh, do we want them to live in internment camps or be made to work where they're told to or whether they can get married or not or how many children they can have or if they can have any at all? And, and it goes on and on and on. Just read their literature. It's all there. These people are monsters. And so we're going to win in spite of all the mudslinging and personal attacks. Personal yeah. attacks have a way of dissipating themselves. And that will happen. We've got to back him with all our might because he's the only legal cudgel that we have left. And yes, he may get killed. So we're going to have to have a very strong vice presidential candidate. I feel by the people who run our government, that is. The same people that murdered Jack Kennedy. And uh, uh, yes, it's going to be a hard road. Uh, can he be elected? Absolutely. And so we got it going for us this time. We got to stay with it, and we got to win. I mean, I live in another far off country. What goes on in Los Angeles and New York really now has nothing to do with me. Nothing. I live in a different world where these kind of things are not going to happen. And I'm getting 20 or 30 emails a day, tell me how to get out of here. I tell every one of them, I said, I think you should go and do the things you have to do to make such a decision if you're qualified to do so. And if Ron Paul doesn't get elected, then you can make your move. A lot of people are going to wait around until they pick him up and put him in an internment camp if Mr. Obama is reelected. Yeah. And it won't matter if he's reelected or if you get one of these, you know, puppet neocons in the White House. It's just going to be business as usual. And I've decided to stay. I've decided to keep the fight going. And it is the only choice that we have is Ron Paul. I mean, there's probably going to be some good third party candidates that are wanting to run for the Libertarian Party, Constitution Party, Independent. But the sad reality is most of them have never don't even have a percentage of, you know, um, of a name like Ron Paul has been building for quite some time now. So they have a way, way, way less chance than he has. And I'm going to support him no matter what. And that's one advantage that Ron Paul does have. No matter how bad the mainstream media and his uh, you know, rivals attack him, you know, he has his people to back him up, like us. You know, going out there, confronting the lies, confronting the BS and the propaganda, and, you know, setting people straight. Look, what the mainstream media is telling you is a bunch of nonsense. It's been proven that this, this, and this is not true. Ron Paul is not an isolationist. He's a non-interventionist. You know, you get, but that's just the way it is. We have to continue the fight. And I think that's what really sets Ron Paul apart from the other guys because, you know, the people that are on their staff are bought and paid for. Most of Ron Paul's are a volunteer army, and volunteers will always fight way harder than a paid force. And that's true. We should look at our Civil War. I mean, our Revolutionary War. Exactly. A handful of people changed history. And we're going to have to do that again. Remember that, listeners. We have to do it. We have to make it happen. Unless you, you know, like living uh, in slavery. That's what's got to come to. These yeah, people think that we're wild beasts. Yeah, I agree entirely. And you just look at where they stand on the issues. That's exactly where the elite feel about us. They see us as bugs. They see us as you know, creatures to be stepped on. They don't even see us as the same species anymore. I mean, what we're going through is similar to what happened in the Revolutionary War. I mean, not, not physically, but I mean, they had good days and they had bad days. And you got to you got to stay the course. I mean, if if George Washington and his men gave up at Valley Forge, where would we be right now, Bob? We'd be British citizens. That's right. And under the heel of the Queen, while she has the states worth trillions of dollars, people starve in London. That's not a very good kind of government, I'll tell you that. Not at all. And. And that's what you have to do because there's always going to be good days and there's going to be bad days, but we got to keep fighting. we got to stay the course. And, it, I mean, I understand because, you know, our emotions get tied into this. And, you know, we're only human. We're not machines. We can only take so much of the negative attacks. And, I, you know, you just got to keep going because we have to understand the big picture, what we're fighting for. Like you said, 
we're not, we're not just fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for future generations that have yet to come. We're fighting for them so they have a right to eventually be born and live their life in peace and freedom, not just here in our country, but throughout the world. I mean, what's coming down to is a crossroads between tyranny and liberty. And that's what this fight is about. Amen. And that's the crux of the whole thing. And we can't let these people do what they want to us. The same thing happened in 1933 in Germany through the Enabling Act. And uh, Germany was never the same. And they're doing the same thing over again in America. And the same people are financing it. Yeah, it's, it's just history repeating itself. And, and they do learn from history in their own twisted way. They're like, well, we, we tried to pull this off on the people back then, but we kind of uh, missed a few things. So they keep going back to the drawing board over and over again to get the, the perfect tyranny upon us. And that's what they have in store for us. Basically, with what's happening in North Korea, I, I see that as a, as a template for what they want to do to everybody. You're right about that. And that is what they want to do to everybody. And, you know, to anybody who's got half a brain that uses it, all the evidence is out there. You know, we don't make this stuff up. I mean, we discuss it. We have our own ideas and where it's headed. Now, some of us have uh, deeper backgrounds than others. Some of them have, some of these writers have no backgrounds at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I just can't read the, I can't believe the crap that I have to read that people send to me about what's going to happen. I mean, they're out for lunch. And I see a, an underlying terrible bitterness in a lot of the writing out there. And it, um, it really comes of attitudinal, attitudinally of a manic depressives. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really surprised the people will read such stuff. They can't even see through it. Now, it is amazing that some people will write some wild and crazy things, and I've read my fair share of it. And I, I, think, I think these people that are doing it, either they've gone down the wrong hole, ingested the wrong info, or else they're intentionally doing it, either you know, to get their own jollies off or else they're being obviously bought and paid for to you know, spew out disinfo. And unfortunately, Bob, as you and I both know, that kind of drama does sell. I mean, look at most of the crap that's on TV these days. And that stuff's very, very popular. Well, Charlie Sheen's not there anymore, so I'm not watching. <laughs> yeah, there's really, I mean, this day and age, I mean, TV programming has continued to get worse and worse of each passing decade. And, I mean... It's funny, my sisters are in town, you know, and they like to watch a little bit of TV, and I just walk in there, and I'm like, what are you watching? And I don't even know what the show is anymore. I mean, they're like, hey, yeah, I've got to watch the season finale of this show. I'm like, I've never heard of that show before. It just shows how out of touch I've got. I mean, there's one or two shows I like that I'll still watch, but for the most part, I just tune it off and focus on reading and writing and, you know, watching YouTube videos and stuff. But that is another interesting facet is the fact how well that the – the sheeple, the jellyfish, the zombies, whatever you want to call them, have been programmed. And I watched this pretty interesting documentary the other day, Bob, that showed how basically a lot of these corporations are, are programming kids from a very young age to basically be consumers. And that's exactly how the corporate elite see us as consumers from cradle to grave. And it was just amazing the extent they go through just to get kids to buy uh, Disney toys or SpongeBob and I mean, and it's just ridiculous how far, you know, the corruption has gotten because these people have gotten in bed with the government, the government's gotten in bed with them, and the programming is all around us, hitting us at all levels. And it's nothing new. Ever since we've had TV, uh, they have upgraded their efforts to uh, cloud the minds of people. And that's what they've done. And they've got away with it, and most people don't know it. I mean, you and I can see it, and others can, but 85% of the population doesn't have a clue. No, they don't, and it's, it, it really is sad and heartbreaking because 
people are now being programmed to believe that they can put their kid in front of a TV box when they're just a little little baby and watch Barney or Sesame Street, and that's all they need for education. And that's not, that's not how you educate a child. You educate a child by reading to them, by teaching them on their own. That's, that's how you create a smart individual. And you see the problems that we're having today in society with children. You know, ADD, ADHD on the rise, autism, the, the list goes on and on. And, you know, people wonder, well, well, why is this happening to our kids? Well, it's because <laughs> you're buying into this. I remember when I returned from darkest Africa. I went back to the Los Angeles area. And we put our son in kindergarten. And uh, he did not know the alphabet or any of the numbers. They didn't do that sort of thing over in Africa. And, you know, when the kids started school, that's when they started to teach them. So the teacher says, well, you have to find a way to get them to know him to know that. And I say, pray tell, what do you do? Oh, we have a curriculum that's based upon uh, Sesame Street and, uh, and uh, the child already being at a level so that we can teach them. I said, really? I said, well, I'm going to make your job real easy. Take a good look at me and my family, and you will never see us again. <laughs> because you don't have a clue of what education is all about. And so with that said, I took my son to a private school. He never attended a public school all the way through college. And fortunately, I was able to afford that. Not everybody can, and I guess very few people can. And um, when my children finished uh, college, uh, they had no bills because they paid them all. I was happy to do it. When I started in college myself, <clears throat> My school, Northeastern, charged uh, $600 a year, no, $500 a year, and Harvard was 600 And in the fourth year, it was 10000 And the reason I remember it distinctly, uh, I was a bit older because I had gone to the military and returned. So I wasn't 19, I was 23, 4. And, and uh, so they wanted me to com continue to play on their hockey team. I was a very good hockey player when I was young. That's ice hockey. And um, so I said, well, what are you going to do for me? They said, we're going to give you a $1,000 scholarship. I said, but it costs 10000 to go to school. And he said, well, that's all we can offer. I says, well, I guess I don't play because I'm not going to go out and get injured for nothing, virtually. <laughs> so you give me a full scholarship, I'm not playing. And I didn't play. And my two uncles who were professors at the school were furious. I said, no, that's not right. I agree, it's not right. I mean, especially now with the way collegiate sports is, Bob, they make a lot of money off their football and basketball and hockey games. And, and you know, you think at the very least they'd be able to afford, you know, a decent education for these young boys and girls who are playing on their sports teams. I mean, it's it's a big money-making business. And they're functioning Ill illiterate, many of them. They and finish, they can't even read and write. Yeah. They have a degree from college. It's incredible. Yeah, and, and that's a, you know, strong – you know, another strong point about how big of a failure the public education system has been. I mean, it was bad enough whenever I was in high school back in the 90s, but, you know, 10 years later, I mean, I hear stories way worse than whatever I encountered back then. I mean, I, I had some winners for teachers. I mean, one example, they uh, focused so much more on the sports department in my local school back in East Texas that we had, I, I kid you not, a bus driver, that's right, a bus driver, as our algebra teacher. And I made really good grades, Bob, but you know why? Because all you had to do was, uh, you know, do your homework. 
but did she grade the you know homework? Did she bother to say, hey, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, go fix that? No. So next year, Bob, when I got into geometry, <laughs> I kind of had some problems. Well, you should have told the bus driver to change grades. <laughs> yeah, but th- see, that's the problem because the next year I had a real teacher <laughs> instead of a bus driver. <laughs> Oh, but that's that's I mean that's the concern though, because it's not just bus drivers they have going in teaching classes they have coaches going in and teaching classes as well and most of them aren't there to teach uh, English or uh, history or whatnot I mean it's just we fo- we focus on the wrong things we glorify sports and reality shows and movies and TV when we sh- we should be you know focusing on. Uh, intellectual achievements, you know, aspiring to be smarter and read better and write and be scientists and mathematicians, that, that's a huge chunk of the problem. Oh, what mistake Cicero made so that he lost his head? Well, there's, there's a lesson to be learned from everything. It might be as simple as he picked the wrong group, but the point is you've got to learn those things. I mean, Julius Caesar was an engineer. And all of his Roman soldiers were engineers. And all of his non-Roman soldiers who became Roman soldiers, they were engineers. And I had four years of Latin. And they went back and forth across Gaul, building bridges and taking them apart. (laughs) And uh, and some of those uh, roads, pathways, uh, etc., they're still there all over Europe. A beautiful example is the uh, Corniche uh, above um, above uh, Saint-Tropez. Uh, you take the road uh, back into France from Monaco, and it, it what it is is a series of switchbacks. And it's the same road the, the Romans built. You can, you can tell by looking at it, you know, how it's constructed, and, and these guys were wonderful engineers. And, uh, but anyway, there was more to it than that. But uh, these are important things. Um, If you're a professional soldier, you're not having war all the time, so you've got to find something else to do. And they did that throughout the Roman Empire, all the way from England uh, down through Spain and Portugal. And and, um, and it's, it's... it's things that people don't know about, but you learn from those things. And that's what's missing in school. They're not being taught anything. No, they're not. And basically, I mean, schools and prisons are basically starting to look one and the same. And as you and I both know, Bob, that's being done by design. You're right. But Ron Paul can fix all that. And if he isn't there to fix all that, we're the losers. And our society will just totally fall apart. And um, there will be warfare of one kind of another inside and outside the United States, guaranteed. Yeah, I I, I believe that, Bob. I honestly do. I I think that the only person running for office right now that's going to – that we have any hope of undoing all this stuff that's happened, you know, not just the wars, but this police state at home, the economy, the bloated, out-of-control government is Congressman Ron Paul. And if people don't support him – and they, they think one of the other guys is going to save the day, then they're fooling themselves. I uh, had to call a subscriber today, and I interrupted him. But he wasn't this, you know, he wanted to renew. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, counting ammunition. And he's not the only one out there doing that. I mean, there's a lot of people that, that justifiably so. You see the direction our country is going with the passage of this bill and that bill and more and more erosion of our freedoms and liberties and the realization that if we don't get Ron Paul in there and the the possibility of an economic collapse and who knows what else they have up their sleeves. I mean, there are definitely a lot of people out there that are are preparing for the worst-case scenario. I mean, I'm still trying to be optimistic. I'm still trying to hope for the best because the last thing I want is a violent, bloody French-style revolution. I mean, you and I have talked about that before, and, it's going to get nasty if it comes down to that. Well, I think what you do is you plan for the best, but you also plan for the worst, plan B, so to speak, and uh, then you are at least able to face plan B. 
and implement it. And uh, but you got to think about what happens if you're not successful, and that's what you do. And it doesn't mean you have to be pessimistic. You don't have to be suicidal. Uh, you don't have to blow things out of proportion. You just say, I know what's going on, and I think this could happen, so I'm making these preparations, and hopefully this insurance that I'm preparing for myself will never have to be used. That's pretty simple. Yeah. It, I mean, you could have explained it any better, to be honest, Bob. Uh, we do have a couple email questions. Uh, the first one comes from Lorne. Do you know ab- about the above ground ratio of gold to silver, and uh, do you believe that it will uh, the value ratio will get back to uh, sixteen to one with gold holding its current or better value? I don't know <laughs> because I Maybe. don't watch it. I've only been doing this for fifty three years, and it's never worked. So why would I want to do something that doesn't work? It's just something that grown-up children like to play with. I mean, look at these people who do waves and and charting and uh, and uh, cycles. You can't do them anymore. The markets are all rigged. And until Ron Paul gets elected and does away with that, all that stuff isn't going to work. It's a fundamental world until we can use those things again. I think charts are great, especially long-term. But short-term, you can't use them. There's no parallel with reality. That's why for the last six years, almost every chartist, wavist, and cyclist has been wrong. I mean, we get them out there screaming now, hey, the sky is falling. It's falling. They're telling us gold's going to go down to eight hundred dollars and silver down to six dollars and and all of these foolishnesses. <laughs> and even with manipulation, they couldn't do that. And you've got to say to yourself, what are these people thinking about? And then when they find out some of them that what they're doing doesn't work. They find out the reason why, and they say, yeah, I can understand that now. Then they say, well, you can't go in the futures market. You can't go in the derivative market. You can't buy SLV and GLD, and of course you can't buy stocks. I don't think anybody ever told them that between 1930 and 1935, the average gold stock went up over 500% in the middle of a depression. The Dow fell 90%. And you know all the other folder, all that happened. In the late 70s, when we had an inflationary recession, gold and silver shares went up 4-0, 40 times what gold did. Now, I'm not saying that's ever going to repeat. All I'm going to say is that they're going to go up more than the actual metal. And then they say, well, if you don't have your certificate, you're screwed. They're going to steal your stock. Of course they're not going to steal your stock. How do you think they make their money, dummy? They make it in the markets. They don't want to ruin their own thing. And so with that said, the argument is a fallacy. And I could go on. And, but I don't want to, because I don't want to be in negativism like they are. It's just that that's not going to happen. And the people who buy now are the smart ones. Not in derivatives or puts and calls or futures or GLD and SLV. I, I don't recommend them. I make life simple. You buy gold and silver coins, bullion and shares. Simple. It sounds simple enough to me, Bob. Uh, we've got another question from Joe. Uh, he's inquiring about the see well, it was the uh, ABC debate. Near the end of the debate, they had all the candidates saying, "If there's something you could praise about another candidate on the stage, uh, who would it be?" Uh, and it, Rick Perry was actually praising Ron Paul, but then he threw in a book called 
Currency Wars by <clears throat> Jim Rickards. Uh, and uh, Joe has this question. Do you have any opinion on why this book is being promoted by the same people trying to prop up the current system? The same people trying to prop up the current system? As are the, those the ones that are for currency or against it? Uh, the, uh, it was by uh, this book called Currency Wars by Jim Rickards. Yeah, I know who Ricketts is. Yeah, yeah. He's a dis disinformation specialist. Yeah, it seems very convenient. And he, he's not going to like that very well, but I got his number. Mm -hmm. yeah, Came out yeah, of Joe. nowhere two years ago uh, because he was involved in the repackaging of uh, uh, the scandal with the two uh, recipients of the uh, Nobel Prize uh, for um, what today is called algorithms. And uh, they had a company, and uh, they were short gold, and they ate it. And uh, he, he, he was involved in putting the thing back together. What happened was, it was 1999, it was LT, LTCM was the name of the company, and uh, they were trying to corner the gold market, and they got caught with their pants down. And um, so he evidently uh, was uh, involved in the liquidation era. And to show you how smart people are, one of the two guys that ran that operation that went defunct, uh, he's in business today. I'm not saying he did anything wrong. He was just wrong. As far as Ricketts is concerned, I, that was a responsible position. He's a very smart man. Uh, but uh, I know what propaganda is all about. And uh, that's why a lot of people don't want me to be writing and on radio because I tell people too many things they never thought about before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that Jim Rickards fella, he's definitely a piece of work. We've got about a minute left, Bob. Uh, how can people get the international forecaster? Well, uh, the forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. We publish on Wednesday and Saturday. Runs around 35 or 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy those go that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. And everything that you need to know each week is in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com. The International, F O R E C A S T E R.com. You can also go to www.intforecaster.com. Intforecaster.com. If you'd like to ask a question, we answer everyone. Or if you'd like a copy of the report, or if you'd like a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares, you can email us, and that address is bob, B O B, at I N T F O R E C A S T E R dot com. Bob at intforecaster.com. And for those of you who would like to call toll free, that number is 877. Four seven nine eight one seven eight. That's eight seven seven four seven nine eight one seven eight. And you can get the reports there. And also, they have an offering there for a free one year subscription. And the offer that they're making is really terrific. So take advantage of it. Absolutely. Bob, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a great Christmas weekend and everyone else listening. And I'll talk to you next week, sir. You got it. Bye, everybody, and thank you for listening.